Welcome to the Rygate Lecture 2020. My name is Nick D'Souza and I'm the Head of Politics here at Rygate College and with me are some really, really talented students who will be helping us to debate the question which is, is democracy about to die? Now, before um, we start on that debate, uh, you're going to hear from me. I'm going to give a little bit of a lecture um, on what the condition of democracy is like in the UK. Um, and then um, after that, our students, who I will introduce in a minute, will uh, debate the issue uh, on a global level. But um, before I do that, I would like to um, welcome you. Um, and I know that there are um, over 100 people who have signed up to uh, this, this lecture. Um, and I hope that by the end of it, you'll have a good idea of what politics is like um, in Rygate College and that you might think about um, choosing to study it um, next year, perhaps when you start your A-levels. But uh, first of all, I'm going to um, introduce our lovely students. So uh, we're going to go to Etienne, Etienne Baker. Uh, Etienne, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, what school you went to, um, what you're thinking uh, you'll do uh, when you leave Rygate? Um, yeah, sure. So I went to Rygate School before coming to college and I currently study English literature, history and politics. Um, and I'm hoping to study history and politics when I go to university. Fantastic. Um, and I'm now going to go over to Nayan, Nayan Patel. Um, you are um, going to be on Etienne's side. Uh, you're going to be arguing that democracy is about to die, but we're going to hear uh, from you a little bit later. Right now, I just want to uh, want you to tell our audience um, what school you went to and, and what, what you're thinking of doing. Yep. Hi, I am Nayan Patel. I went to Royal Alexandra and Albert School before coming to Rygate College. I currently study history, politics and economics, and I'm hoping to join the British Army after my A-levels. So as you can see, uh, people go on to do uh, lots of different things from joining the army to studying politics and history at university. Um, and uh, now I'm going to introduce you uh, to uh, the two students on the other side of the debate, um, Emily, um, Emily Tilford Kerry. Democracy is not about to die. die. Um, that's the side you're on. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, though? Um, so my name is Emily Tilford Kerry, and I previously went to Oakwood School. And the current A levels I take are English, maths, and politics. Um, I hope to study economics and politics at university. Fantastic. So you can see that we haven't yet put students off. They're still wanting to do politics when they leave um, uh, Rygate. So that's a good sign. However. Um, Layla doesn't want to do politics when she leaves. Um, so Layla, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do want to do? Hi, um, my name's Layla Treacher and I study maths, further maths, chemistry and politics. And um, when I leave Rygate College, I'd like to study mathematics at uni. Fantastic. Um, now, this is my, uh, this is my lecture. So, um, is democracy about to die? Well, first of all, we have to think about what a democracy actually um, needs. And um, so I'm just going to create some criteria here. So for a democracy to not die, for a democracy to live, to breathe, um, it needs, power needs to, to lie in many different places uh, and not just one. So you, we don't want Saddam's Iraq, we want uh, you know, power spread uh, throughout the country. We also must have free and fair elections. You can't have a democracy without that. You need a representative body that holds the government to account, represents the people, uh, stands up for constituents. And in this country, we have a parliament that is supposed to do that. We also need rights and freedoms. We need um, a government that is limited by what it can do to you. So it can't just burst into your home in the middle of the night um, and, and take you away never to be seen again. We also need the, the, the public to legitimise what decision makers do, which means we need public participation in elections, in protests, um, in government. So 
public participation is really important. And we're going to judge whether democracy is about to die by looking at whether these five things are working as they should. So let's start then uh, with the idea that power should lie in many different places. Now, in front of you, uh, you'll see some pictures. I'm not going to do lots and lots of different text. Um, exhibit A is Brexit. Now, who was involved in that decision? Well, probably if your parents um, are uh, listening, they were involved in that decision. They voted either to leave or to remain. And you see there that um, I'm not very good at maths. Um, maybe Layla can help me out. Is that 33 million uh, people that participated roughly uh, in that referendum? Um, um, and that's, that's a 33 million are helping to make that decision on whether the UK should leave the EU. But it didn't stop there because the government then just simply wanted to start, get the ball rolling to leave. But the Supreme Court weighed in and said, actually, Parliament also legally has to um, OK this. They have to give authority. They have to give their blessing to start the ball rolling on leaving the EU. So there we see the people involved in that decision. We see the courts involved in that decision. We see our representatives in Parliament involved in that decision. And Parliament spent two or so years debating it. We also had two subsequent general elections in 2017 and 2019. Finally, until we got to the point where in January 2020, the EU withdrawal bill uh, was passed and the UK left the EU, formally at least, uh, on the 1st of February 2020. And that decision, therefore, involved an awful lot of people. So perhaps that shows that democracy is not about to die because it power lies in many different places. Decisions um, are arrived at um, with lots of people involved. And let's also look at exhibit B, devolution. In the last 23 years, we've seen the Scottish Parliament, which is the picture in the middle, um, gain more and more power away from Westminster. The same is true of the Welsh Assembly. The building is um, on the bottom left. Um, and you see that rather lovely uh, sort of strange looking building. That's uh, the seat of London government. Um, it's, it's where uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan uh, runs London from. And then um, if you look at the, um, the, the right of the picture, you see Mayor Andy Burnham of the greater uh, Manchester area. Um, and he, of course, was in the news recently uh, for criticising the government's COVID policy. So you can see that these devolved bodies are taking decisions um, and they're willing to um, criticise the government. And so power isn't just flowing from the government. It's actually uh, in these places that you're actually looking at uh, on your screens. So now I've just painted a very rosy picture. I've said that power lies in many places or does it let's look at exhibit a the institute of economic affairs now the institute of economic affairs is something called a think tank and they publish policy papers suggesting different policies and so on what you might not know is that they've made nine separate donations totaling thirty-two thousand pounds to matt hancock the health secretary now, why would they make nine separate donations totaling £32,000 to the health secretary? Are they providing cash for influence? Now, the interesting thing is several members of the current cabinet are associated with the Institute of Economic Affairs and have received money from them. This group, interestingly, gets its funding from Exxon, which is an oil company. And this group has also published papers saying that the NHS should be privatised. So the health secretary right now, in charge of the UK's COVID response, in charge of the NHS, is receiving money from an organisation that wants to privatise the NHS. And when the government is coming up with its environmental policies, why is it, or some of its members, receiving money from a group that is sponsored by an oil company. So are some groups just too powerful? Do they have undue influence on our decision making? I'm just going to leave it there and let you decide. I'm going to now go on to exhibit B, which is the idea that, yes, we have devolution, but actually in England, we don't really have much 
devolution at all. In fact, 85% of local council budgets come from central government and they often, that money often comes with strings attached. So the government directs councils on how to spend money. That's top down decision making, which isn't very democratic. The democrat democratic ideal of having decisions taken at local a level as possible is far from reality, particularly in England. So let's now come on to the second necessity for democracy to live and flourish, and that's the idea of free and fair elections. Now, the picture in front of you is a painting by Holgarth, and I think it, the title is just Election. And what it shows um, is basically uh, voters being bought off, <laughs> voters being bribed, um, uh, voters uh, being given food in return for votes. Now, this was at a time where um, people would know how you vote. There was no secret ballot and um, you could openly bribe the electorate. Now, we've had many rules uh, since then, including the Secret Ballot Act. And what that means is, is that I can't know how you vote. And that's good because if you vote the way I don't want you to, I can't just go round to your house and beat you up because I, I don't know how you voted. And so therefore I can't intimidate you. So the secret ballot is really important. And that's what we have in this country. And now that is a sort of accepted as a standard of democracy. And we have the idea that all adults can vote. So all adults over the, uh, over the age of 18 can vote. And perhaps most importantly is our election results are trusted. If you look and see what is happening in America, where Donald Trump has not conceded the US presidential election. He's cast doubt on the validity of the election results, even though there is scant evidence for any fraud whatsoever. You can look to the UK and say, well, that doesn't happen here. Now, whether or not you voted Conservative in 2019, whether or not you wanted Boris Johnson to win the 2019 general election, no one was saying that the results the Conservatives got was somehow wrong. You know, they got 43, 44% of the vote. No one was saying, oh no, they didn't. So <clears throat> you can actually uh, judge a democracy by how much people accept a result. But I've really talked about how they are free. Are they fair? Now let's just have a look at this table here. Uh, we use something called first past the post to decide who wins an election in this country. Now, if you look at the, the column where it says constituency one, this is an imagine, imaginary vote, but you can see there that the Conservatives win four votes, Labour wins three votes, Lib Dems win three votes, and so the Conservatives win in constituency one. And then you can see in constituency two, the Labour Party wins there. They win the most votes in that constituency, so they win that seat. And in constituency three, the same is the, is, uh, as in constituency one, the Conservatives win that seat. They win the most votes. They win four votes. Labour wins three votes. Lib Dems three votes. So the Conservatives win. So what we get is the Conservatives winning two seats overall and Labour winning one seat overall. But then look at the national vote column. The Conservatives win but they don't get the most votes. In fact, they finished third overall in the number of votes that they get, and yet they win the seats um, needed to, to win the whole election. And so this is the unfairness of our electoral system first past the post. It's what Lord Helsham described as an elected dictatorship. Parties win on a minority of the votes and yet win 100% of the power. And the winning party often enjoys a disproportionate share of the seats. The Conservatives, for example, in 2015, won 37% of the vote, but 51% of the seats. And Labour in 2001 won 41% of the vote, but won a whopping great big 63% of the seats in the House of Commons. So they completely dominated the House of Commons, even though a majority of people did not vote in, um, for the government. In fact, not since the early 1950s have we had a government elected on the majority of the popular vote. So maybe our elections are, are free. 16 and 17 year olds might beg to differ. They might say we should have the vote. 
that they are certainly not fair. Now, let's move on to the idea that we have a parliament, a parliament that is supposed to represent us and to hold the government to account. Now, we see some examples here. Parliament challenged the government over the Windrush scandal, the sending back um, of um, Afro-Caribbean uh, citizens of this country uh, to uh, the West Indies uh, because they didn't quite have the right paperwork and that paperwork happened to be destroyed by the Home Office. Um, a huge scandal. And then um, today, uh, uh, this, uh, this year we have the Scientific and Technology Committee in the House of Commons criticising the government's response in building up COVID testing capacity. These two examples show that our parliament is willing to stand up to government and point out their failures. And that's really, really important that a government holds, that a parliament holds the government to account. And if we look at representation, well, there are more women in parliament uh, than ever before. Um, and MPs from all parties stand up uh, for their constituents. If you look at the lady in the middle there, Jess Phillips, um, she stood outside um, a school in her Bir Birmingham Yardley constituency um, and she defended the school um, and it's teaching children about gay and straight relationships and about how it's perfectly fine to have two fathers or two mothers. Um, and then Sharon Hodgson on the right, um, she has um, uh, stood up in the House of Commons telling of her own personal tragedy. Um, calling for death certificates to be given to children who are stillborn. Um, so you can see from those examples that politicians are human, that they may are increasingly resembling us as a society, a multicultural diverse society, and that they stand up for us. Or do they? So let's um, have a look um, at whether our parliament truly is representative. Well, the picture on your left is a picture of the House of Lords. Not a single member of the House of Lords is elected, um, and 92 of them um, are hereditary peers. So um, the hereditary prin prin principle remains in the House of Lords. It is unelected as well. Um, and they account uh, for half of Parliament. Equally, when you say, what makes up Parliament? The answer is the government. The government sits in Parliament. It dominates Parliament. So when a party wins a majority of seats at an election, it means that they can dominate how Parliament works. That then affects the quality of scrutiny because often you don't criticise yourself as much as you will the other side. And so you get laws being pushed through Parliament very, very quickly, perhaps with uh, undue regard for um, decent lawmaking. Um, the Trade Union Act of 2016, the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016 are both examples of laws that alter the rights of citizens and increase the power of government. So quite important laws, yet they pass really quickly. And in fact, Boris Johnson's um, EU Withdrawal Act passed in a month and a half. Um, even though we debated um, various other deals uh, for two or three years, um, as soon as they got the majority, they rammed it through. Um, so is this the kind of parliament we want that uh, has a government that dominates it, pushes things through, that has half of, it, of, of parliament unelected? I think not. So let's move on to uh, the next um, important pillar of democracy, for democracy to thrive, to be alive. We need to see that there are rights and freedoms for individuals. Um, Exhibit A uh, is the Human Rights Act. Um, now, this allows citizens to use UK courts to protect their rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. Nothing to do with the EU, by the way. Um, the European Convention was drawn up after World War II to um, protect people who were being persecuted by their own governments. So think of uh, Jews um, uh, fleeing Nazi um, Germany um, and so on. Um, and so it, it was designed to do that. It was drawn up by um, British lawyers um, 
and um, the main court that enforces the European Convention on Human Rights sits in Strasbourg. And all the Human Rights Act did was say, well, instead of going to Strasbourg, you can use um, local courts to enforce your rights. And on the left there, Exhibit A, um, uh, is an elderly couple. And they were, unbelievably, they were put into separate care homes, even though they've been together for 60 years, they were put into separate care homes by their local authority. And um, the family um, sued the local authorities under the Human Rights Act, and the, um, uh, the courts ruled that the local authorities had breached the right to a family life contained in the European Convention and ordered the local authorities to reunite that lovely couple on the left. Um, so that's what it means uh, when we talk about enjoying rights and freedoms. It means that we have legal protections using the Human Rights Act. Um, and Exhibit B, uh, you may remember, uh, that uh, little picture there is a little duck island that parents may remember anyway. Um, and um, this uh, peer, um, actually, I think he was an MP, um, he, he was revealed to have claimed public money on expenses uh, to clean out his little duck island there around his moat. He happened to live in a castle. Um, this, of course, refers to the expenses scandal, um, revelations that MPs were on the make um, and claiming for all sorts from porn videos to uh, light bulbs to trouser presses to um, mortgage relief uh, and so on. Now, how do we know about all of this? Because of the Freedom of Information Act, because uh, particularly journalists can request uh, information um, about what the government is up to, um, so long as they can prove it's in the public interest. And MPs' expenses certainly was in the public interest, and um, it shed daylight on what they were doing. And many MPs uh, were booted out at the, uh, the subsequent election, or some of them even went to jail. And that demonstrates that uh, there are consequences uh, for um, wanting your moat cleaned uh, or wanting your duck island um, sorted out. OK, so that's all lovely. Or is it? So um, exhibit A um, is the idea that we still have a government that is overly uh, powerful. The government... Um, well, Stuart Weir says that the rule of law is what the government says it is. Because the government dominates Parliament so much, too much power is placed in the hands of government and too much power is in the hands of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister can use what's called the royal prerogative. Now, these are undefined powers that include their role as commander in chief of the armed forces. Um, and um, they pass from the monarch uh, to uh, the Prime Minister over time. So Gordon Brown, um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, used the royal prerogative to send troops to Afghanistan, extra troops to Afghanistan. David Cameron initiated military action in Libya before there was a vote in Parliament to authorise it, uh, to authorise it. So they have huge powers over our armed forces. They can move forces around uh, the globe like chess pieces and not necessarily be scrutinised. Um, equally, if we look at exhibit B, I told you about the Freedom of Information Act. Well, when the journalist requested that MPs' expenses be revealed, this is what they got from the government on the uh, right-hand side. They got everything was, they got a reams and reams of paper that was heavily redacted. And so actually it was very difficult to find out what MPs' expenses were, what wrongdoing uh, was going on, um, because this, on the right hand side is what was released, just lots of black ink on a piece of paper. So um, the Freedom of Information Act is actually very, very weak. Um, the Guardian, for example, was not allowed to publish details of um, the weapons that we're selling to Saudi Arabia because arms sales are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and the correspondence between MPs is, are also exempt, and so too are royal correspondence. So we don't know what Prince Charles is sending to Boris Johnson um, at the moment. Um, so we don't necessarily know everything we need to know. The Freedom of, Informa Freedom of Information Act is pretty weak. So let's go to the last pillar, uh, the last sort of um, 
feature that we must see in a democracy uh, in order to uh, give it a clean bill of health. Exhibit A is the EU referendum. Look at that turnout, 33. I, I, I actually should have just looked at the slide last and not asked uh, Leila to uh, add up the numbers, but um, 33 and a half million people voted. It was the biggest single democratic exercise this country has ever had. 72% of eligible voters uh, participated in that. And if we look at uh, general election turnout, um, we see um, a steady decline, but then an increase in the last few elections. If you look at 2001 on there, um, we had 59% turnout, then it climbs, I think, to 61%, uh, then uh, 66, uh, 63, 66, 69%. So it's all going in the right direction in terms of general elections. Um, equally, um, we are seeing people uh, participate not just in referendums, and of course the Scottish independence referendum was another uh, such example of high turnout, but also um, people engaging, um, signing petitions, for example. Many of you may have signed an e-petition. Um, people um, taking part in public protests, whether it's Black Lives Matter protests in the summer uh, or the climate strikes uh, last year. So participation arguably is, dis uh, is increasing and that's a good thing. Um, and we see that in, as I said, other forms of participation. But what of the quality of this participation? Well, first of all, I should say that actual general election turnout was down last year. Maybe it was because it was held in the winter. But let's think then about what we are being asked to participate in. Is it the case that the referendums that people have been involved in, particularly the one on Brexit, um, undermine the legitimacy and the authority of Parliament to make tough decisions. And more importantly, haven't referendums created minorities where they didn't exist before? So, for example, um, young people voted in huge numbers to remain in the EU, didn't get what they want. Um, Afro-Caribbeans voted in huge numbers to remain in the EU, didn't get what they want. The Scots, the uh, the Northern Irish um, and uh, Londoners voted to remain in the EU. Suddenly these uh, groups and these regions became uh, minorities. Now, of course, if the result was different, then you would talk about um, how uh, different groups of people then felt like minorities. The problem with referendums is they automatically create division. They all, because of their yes, no answer, there's always going to be a loser. There, is, there, there are no shades of grey, it's always black and white. Equally, maybe the way we're asking people to participate is leading to divisiveness um, that then uh, leads to um, minorities feeling really under threat. I walked past uh, a Polish centre in Hammersmith just after the referendum took place, and this is the sign I saw in front of you. Uh, it was a Polish centre that was established just after World War II uh, for veteran Polish soldiers who had fought alongside British soldiers to rid the world of Nazism. Um, and then just a few days after that referendum, you see this sign on a Polish centre. Um, so we have seen this kind of tension um, be unleashed, this kind of nastiness be unleashed by the nature of the participation that we are asking people to take part in. Um, you might also look to social media and say, yes, that's wonderful that we're all uh, kind of tweeting our politicians on, um, on, on Twitter. Um, but what about how um, the way people think is being manipulated by shady news organizations and so on? Are we losing our sense of what is truth and what is not? And then when we look at the conventional forms of participation, as I said, general election turnout was slightly down last year, uh, but we also have to look at how many people are joining political parties. And um, it doesn't look too good. You know, barely a million people in this country actually are members of political parties. Um, Labour is by far and away the largest uh, mass movement political party. Many of those people though joined perhaps because they supported Jeremy Corbyn. Now he has gone, I'd be interested to see whether membership levels uh, fall as well. Um, so 
here is perhaps some suggestions um, on how we can try and keep democracy afloat. And this is something for you to talk about with your parents. Maybe we should have a fairer electoral system. There's plenty of different options to do that. In fact, we use some of them in our um, devolved bodies um, at the moment. Perhaps we could lower the voting age and get more young people into politics at an early age. Maybe we need to end the centralization, the top-down government, and have more devolution in England. Um, do we need to ensure that our rights can't simply be um, written away by an act of parliament that is so dominated by either unelected peers or a government with a huge majority and therefore have a codified constitution to limit the ability of governments to erode rights. To increase turnout, should we have compulsory voting? Um, the Freedom of Information Act is weak, should we strengthen it? Should we elect the House of Lords? Um, and of course, when I uh, have this debate with my students, usually in the first few weeks um, of when they start the course, um, we talk about whether 16 and 17 year olds might vote. And many 16 and 17 year olds actually might say, no, I don't think we know enough. But remember this poster um, from just before World War II, uh, and it was a suffragist poster, and it basically summed up what a woman might be and yet not have the vote. And when I think of quite a lot of our, our students who are quite remarkable, and you're gonna see how wonderful they are in a minute, and when I think of young people who might be caring for someone, maybe their parent who is ill, uh, when I think of uh, some of our young people who want to serve in the armed forces, and yet we still don't give them the vote, that's quite interesting to me. Um, and I think, I hope that this has been interesting to you, and maybe I've given you some food for thought. But to continue with our debate, uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and. I'm going to hand it over to um, our students um, and I'm going to have some water as well in a second. Um, and we're going to start uh, the poll, um, as you, I think you can see that um, in, in front of you maybe right now. Um, is democracy about to die? You can start voting or you might want to wait if you want um, to hear what our amazing students um, have to say. Um, so I'm just going to minimize, minimize that on my screen for a second. Um, and um, is democracy about to die? Who was going first? I can't remember who we said was going first. Was it Etienne who was going first? Yes. All right. So Etienne is going uh, to uh, make the case that democracy is about to die. By the way, students may well put their hands up. So you might see them raise their hands. They're actually in the same room as me. So uh, socially distanced. Um, and, and so I will uh, pick on them. They're not actually raising their hands to you in any way. Okay, so um, Etienne, would you like to unmute yourself and, and tell us what we need to hear? Um, yeah, so uh, me and Nayan are gonna be arguing that democracy is about to die due to a combination of voter apathy, elitism, growing populism, and a lack of adaptability for reform. So if we take voter apathy first, there's a feeling of resentment, which is leading to illegitimate governments from poor um, voter performance in elections. So in 2018, only 25% of 16 to 17 year olds were actually registered to vote for the next year in the coming election. And ethnic minorities are only 31% satisfied with the current system of governing. But yet we consider the UK to be one of the better democracies. So if this is what we consider a thriving, healthy democracy, then surely democracy is about to die. Thank you very much. Um, and um, for um, the, the people who are defending democracy, saying that it's okay, it's not about to die, um, it's Emily. Uh, so Emily is going to uh, open the debate for us. By the way, once that is done, then there will be a back and forth uh, between everybody. So um, Emily, do you wanna take it away? Uh, so myself and Leila will tonight argue this proposition based on three key arguments. Uh, pluralism, in the many places that power is held, therefore it is sh shared. Uh, the potential for future reform and political engagement. Um, just to go quickly onto one example, um, to look at pluralism. As Nick mentioned in the earlier lecture, um, Article 50 and the triggering of that um, demonstrated the multiple institutions that were required for an action to be taken and therefore power to be shared. 
therefore if power is shared there are multiple checks and balances which ensures that democracy is therefore not about to die thank you so we're going to open to the floor um, uh, to our four students here. I think, Nayan, do you want to chip in? And then I uh, want to see some hands up from the other side. Um, Etienne, you can come in and help Nayan if he's in trouble. Uh, go for it, uh, Nayan. Right, okay. So, uh, firstly, regarding the health of, the, of, a, of a democracy, the election system. This is the, the, the means by which you elect your politicians. Um, how can you necessarily claim that a democracy is in good health if the election system itself is of poor quality? So first of all, in 2015, first past the post effectively disenfranchised 4 million UKIP voters. They should have had 81 seats. Likewise, the Greens should have had 25 seats. However, UKIP got one seat in 2019. The Lib Dems got 12% of the votes and yet 2% of the seat. The, what effectively happens with first past the post is it enforces the first, the, pardon me, it enforces a two party system. And this is, of course, not exactly what you want for a democracy. You want, as Emily rightly put, a plurality of um, options. You want a plurality of beliefs, a plurality of parties. Uh, Therefore, the democracy is in very poor health because your, uh, pardon me, our election system does not provide the citizenry with adequate democratic choices. Thank you very much. And now over to um, Leila. Go for it and do put your hands up and, and, and chip in and we're going to go have a backwards and forwards. Go for it. Um, well, I'd agree that first past the post might not be the best electoral system in the UK. Uh, I think you can see how the UK, uh, while we have chosen first past the post, other areas in the UK, such as Scotland, use the additional member system and the single transferable vote in Ireland. It's important to recognise that these are a more proportional system and perhaps they are better suited to our democracy. Uh, as you can see here, democracy is by no means at its at death's door. Free and fair elections are also uh, very much uh, part of the UK democracy. From 2001 to 2017, uh, the general election turnout steadily increased. You can see this uh, when it rose to uh, 69% in 2017. This shows a level of healthy participation within the UK. A particular, um, a particular point is that the referendums have been uh, particularly successful, such as the Scottish independence one and the Brexit referendum. Both of these uh, achieved over 70% uh, turnout. Right, uh, Etienne, you were first. Nayan's room to go as well. Etienne, go for it. Um, yeah, just on your point about different voting systems being used in different places. Um, in England, there is an absolute lack of appetite for change, which is what prevents us from keeping democracy in a healthy state. So the Lib Dems entered the coalition with the Conservatives on the basis that they would get an AV referendum. However, even participation in this referendum was underwhelming. So we can't make the blanket statement referendums are good for our democracy and that they're helping our democracy when even in certain cases, there's underwhelming participation in it. And that also like corresponds with the underwhelming um, support for reforms that would help the voting system in England. Uh -huh. Before we come back, because I'm sure you want to come back at that, but uh, Nayan, you were going to say? Yes, yeah, so I suppose this sort of um, develops Etienne's point here. Um, briefly on Layla's point regarding devolved bodies, um, whilst it may be true that they have slightly better voting systems, I would like to point out that they are not necessarily as influential as the centralised Westminster Parliament. There are certain um, aspects of government uh, that are disallowed to these bodies. So, for instance, foreign policy um, and control of the armed forces is entirely under the, under the control of Westminster. So, the level of influence, do, do these devolved bodies necessarily have enough influence for you to, to firmly suggest that, well, actually, no, democracy is alive because, well, would you look at these other things? They've got much better systems, but they don't count as much. So, for instance, in Northern Ireland, had to have um, had to 
sign into a supply and confidence agreement with the Tories um, under Theresa May in order to secure a budget for the running of their constituents, constituencies. Currently. Okay, Leila, you want to come back at that? The devolution <laughs> is not, it's just, who cares what systems they have? No one cares about devolution, they don't have enough power. Um, I would argue against you there, and I would say that uh, it would be very unwise to allow uh, Scotland and Wales to have their own foreign policy. They still remain part of the United Kingdom, and we have to act together as one uh, when communicating with other countries, especially when we consider things like uh, armed conflicts and our, um, any agreements we go into with places like the uh, European Union. Uh, and as you see, I think devolution in the UK is getting more influential. Uh, the Scottish Parliament has taken on more responsibilities. Uh, it's in control of its education and it's receiving more responsibilities within taxation. Uh, the Welsh Assembly has, has now uh, been declared the Welsh Parliament. This alone shows the development of um, Wales, <laughs> the Welsh democracy. Uh, I think it's also important to note that other regional bodies, such as uh, Manchester, have now got elected mayors, uh, the Northern Powerhouse, as it's uh, referred to. Uh, this has similar powers to the London mayor. And I think this shows how de devolution has been quite successful in the UK. Um, and so democracy is thriving. Etienne, you disagree with uh, Um with Yeah, Leila. I just have a question back to Leila. So you said that Scotland having their own foreign policy would be dangerous, but do they not already have their own foreign policy stance? Because Nicola Sturgeon has come out and said that she supports remaining in the EU. And if Scotland was to like grant their own independence, that they would hope to remain in the EU, but you just said it was dangerous for them to have stances like that on foreign policy. Leila. Uh, I think if Scotland was to become independent, which is a decision they can make for a referendum, which I entirely support, uh, referendums are a form of direct democracy that is quite useful in things such big decisions such as uh, independence and then I would entirely support Nicola Sturgeon's uh, viewpoint that she can have her own relationships with the European Union but at this point they currently remain part of the EU as a, as a political leader she's perfectly entitled to her opinions but that doesn't make them law for her country. Um, so Emily? Yeah, I was just going to kind of back up that point. Nicola Sturgeon stating it and Nicola Sturgeon like actually carrying it out in, in the form of legislation. Like they like Scotland cannot go and declare war on another country. They don't have that power in foreign policy. So if Nicola Sturgeon wants to use that rhetoric, that's completely different. OK, so um, just to keep it focused on is democracy about to die? I know that we all have our opinions about Nicola Sturgeon and the Scot and Scottish independence. Um, Nayan. Yeah, so sorry, Nick, but continuing on the topic. <laughs> oh, oh, just ignore me. Just ignore me. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It, this, this is relevant. There, there is method to my madness. Um, I contend that the one of the fundamental aspects of democratic government is fundamental human rights. Most importantly, the right to freedom of speech. Now, regarding those involved bodies, the very Scottish Parliament um, are indeed trying to propose legislation that would stifle freedom of speech, arguably the most important aspect to your democracy. Um, recently, a grieving man was arrested when um, sending an email to Nicola Sturgeon criticizing uh, her COVID lockdown policy. Fun fact, she didn't actually read the email, it was one of her staff members. To add to this further, Hamza Youssef in the Scottish Parliament claimed that their new hate crime bill would actually pers would, ha would have no dwelling defence and would persecute conversations in uh, conversations held at the dinner table. This demonstrates a disregard for the fundamental human right to freedom of speech, especially when one considers that in a democratic society, uncomfortable conversations, perhaps inflammatory conversations, must be had. Therefore, I do indeed believe democracy is about to die. Um, because of the erosion of fundamental human rights. And I hope you don't think I'm cutting you off and denying your freedom of speech, but Leila. Um, so I do think rights are actually upheld, especially in the UK. Um, we have the Human Rights Act, which is protected by the European 
the European Convention of Human Rights. Our judicial body is independent. Uh, furthermore, they can, they can issue incompatibility incombat statements which rule proposed laws uh, to be in breach of the Human Rights Act. Uh, you can see that in 2003, uh, where they ruled the Sexual Offences Act to be in breach of this. I think this shows that in the UK, uh, rights are upheld, especially because we have a separated judiciary. Thank you. And uh, just before Etienne is going to jump in, but we have one minute until our poll closes. So lots of people already voted um, on uh, whether you think democracy is about to die. Uh, maybe Etienne can convince you uh, that it is. Go for it. Um, yeah, so on the point of rights, uh, does the unrepresentative nature not create a dangerous future for our rights? So the growing elitism in the sense of government and of parliament is not changing despite the fact that every year we call for a more representative government but every year that call is not answered so in the cabinet reshuffle of 2020 there seemed to be no progress and it was heavily independent school based and highly unrepresentative making it a corrupt and centralized body right Leila. um while i would argue that um our central government is not perfect and there are elements of elitism I would say that the uh, democracy has come a long way, uh, even in the UK, but it's more important that we look at the wider context. Democracy uh, across the world has grown, uh, especially in there was a dramatic surge between 1975 and 2005, uh, where in these 30 years it spread from being 25% of the world was in democracies to 58%. Uh, it's especially important we look at places like Africa, where the proportion of democracies has more than doubled since 1999. With this uh, global perspective, we can see that democracy is not uh, dying at all, but in fact, it's more healthy than it's ever been. Right, okay. So we're now going to wrap things up. So um, I'd like you to choose one person from each side just to make the final uh, 20 seconds, please, um, before we reveal our poll results and then get on to questions. Um, and oh, we do. You just revealed the poll results. Okay, so our poll results are um, well. Actually, let's ignore them for a second. Etienne, do you want to just uh, round up what you think? Um, don't look at the results yet. <laughs> um, yeah. So it cannot be said that democracy is healthy in a modern global world, as it is evident that voter apathy, growing populism, and elitism are eroding our democratic principles. And even more dangerously, there is a lack of resolve to change these problems, meaning that the fate of our democracy is almost certainly sealed. Thank you very much. And he would like to go on this side, Emily? Uh, as Leila proposed, the increasing proportion of countries that are under democratic systems and the re reduction in the number of autocracies clearly demonstrates that our democracy globally is in a better shape than it's almost ever been in and is nowhere near about to die. Um, the principles... I, I, I find it hard to be right. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I was going to talk to you about that on Friday. <laughs> yeah. um, pluralism and the potential for further re reforms alongside the increased political engagement, even if it is in alternative forms, such as e-petitions and people attending global mass protests, such as Fridays for Future movement and as part of the BLM protests ensures that democracy is not about to die. Thank you very much. And I think we can hear uh, through uh, the virtual sphere, lots of people giving you uh, a round of applause because that was absolutely fantastic. So uh, well done. And I can now uh, reveal <laughs> the final results of our poll. Um, and it was real close uh, for a long time. Is democracy about to die? 49% um, of you said no, it's not about to die. 51% of you said yes, it is about to die. So it's quite similar um, sort of ratio uh, compared to the EU referendum. So uh, yes, so the, the um, democracy is dead or about to be dead uh, wins the debate. So uh, well done. Um, that was absolutely fabulous. Now we're going to turn to uh, some questions and my um, amazing uh, assistant Denise is going to hand me uh, some urgent news. Um, so, and the question is this, 
How can the government be a democracy if there is not a fair and equal representation of all racial, religious um, and gender groups in positions of power? Well, I'm going to hand that over to um, the students, I think. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm going I'm to hand it over to you guys. How can the government uh, be a democracy? When I say you guys, I'm looking uh, to one of my uh, uh, sides and, and, and looking at Leila and Emily. Um, how can the government be a democracy if there is not a fair and equal representation of all racial, religious and gender groups in positions of power? I'm going to take that one. I would say, although they might not be reflective just based on their, their like identity, if the policies that they support are reflective of the wider population, um, say for example, if it was 100% male in the like the chamber that they were sitting in, if they had policies that were in, empowering females, like they had um, pro-choice abortion platforms, that kind of thing, availability of contraception, um, then it can be representative if the policies that they support are representative of the wider population. Right, okay. Uh, did you guys want to come back on that or you're okay? And, and Leila, do you want to uh, add in? Uh, I'll just, I'd like to support Emily here and say, uh, over the last few years, we've seen a growth in women uh, in our UK parliament, as well as a growth uh, in people from uh, black and ethnic minority. So while we may not be reflective of the UK population yet, we are well on our way to ensuring this. Right, OK. Um, so um, good answers there. Um, now, I've got a question here. It's a, it's a politics related one. Uh, what topics will be uh, covered in the course? So in your first year um, as a politics student, uh, we cover UK politics. So issues like this, democracy in the UK, political parties. So what the, the Conservatives um, stand for? What does the Labour Party stand for? Um, we cover electoral systems. And you, you heard um, the students talk a lot about a first past the post and why it's unfair and different types of electoral systems used in the devolved bodies. Then we go on to probably my favourite bit of the UK course, and that's voting behaviour. So why did Boris Johnson uh, win an 80 seat majority in 2019? And we look at different, ele uh, li different elections um, you know, throughout time. So we might look at the 1945 election or the 1979 election. Um, we also look at the prime minister and how much power they have. Uh, and we look at the role of judges um, and how they become involved in politics, along with the impact that the EU has had on uh, UK policy as well. So it's all UK politics in the first year. And then um, in the summer term, going into the second year, we look at political ideologies and we focus on liberalism, conservatism and socialism, and we cover feminism as well. Um, and so that is the part of the course that is quite reflective, it's um, quite philosophical, um, and it's a good, bit, bit of a different tone to it, if you like. Then in the, the, the second year, uh, we do US politics. So we've just been covering the US presidential election, learning about the Electoral College, learning about how uh, US presidents um, get there um, and, 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 and come to win or come to lose, as in the case of Donald Trump. Although, of course, we know, as according to him, he won by a lot. Um, we, we also look at the power of the Supreme Court, uh, why it is um, probably as powerful as any politician. Um, and we also look at uh, race in US politics uh, and a number of things. At the end of the course, we compare US politics with UK politics. So I hope that is a very whistle-stop tour of what we do. Um, I've also got another question. Um, how many, um, uh, what does that say? How many hours? So I've got to say about how many hairs. Um, right, so how many hours of work are students expected to do outside college? Well, students typically have, at the moment, they have about uh, four hours and 20 minutes, roughly, of lessons uh, a week. Um, and uh, we expect them to match that out of class. So we would expect them to do uh, four hours and 24 and a half hours of work outside of class um, and, um, and all the students looking straight faced. So I'm sure that is exactly what they uh, do and judging by the grades you're all getting, I'm sure it is. Um, so about four hours um, outside of class um, for each subject. Okay, uh, we also have another question. Uh, what are exams like? Tough, um, um, no, they're thoroughly enjoyable. Um, so um, the, 
the, the politics course um, um, has three exams, two hour exams each. So, so sorry, three two hour exams, all taken at the end of the two years of study. Um, and um, in uh, two of those um, exams, you have a mixture of source based questions and essay based questions. Um, you also in the US politics um, uh, exam, you have a number of uh, short answer questions, but it's all exam based. Uh, we really believe um, in simulating the exam as much as possible. So we do do quite a lot of timed assessments um, every few weeks at the end of each topic um, so that students get really used to those time conditions, to those exam conditions. And by the time they get to the exam conditions, uh, they get used to it. And that's why we think, you know, we are, um, we're really proud of our results that we get at politics uh, at, at Rygate. Um, we had 85% A star to B uh, in 2019, uh, the last time there was an external exam, of course. Um, and we're really proud of that. And we think it's because we prepare students for the exam as much as we can, but we also engage in debates like this and students who, who love their learning tend to go on uh, and, and, and love the exam. So I hope that's okay. Um, and um, I've got another question here, uh, quite a few coming through. Um, how can we say the UK has a healthy democracy if the majority of our legislative body is unelected? Do you want to take this side and, 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 and sort of, do, do you want to uh, go for it, Nayan or Etienne, uh, and, and sort of agree with this person? Uh. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are correct, kind sir or madam. I'm not too sure what your name was. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you have a uh, large portion of your government, you know, the people who are making the laws, who are taking your taxes, because remember, taxation without representation is theft. So, yes, you are absolutely correct. Um, you, you, I would love to hear how the other side responds to, to such bold assertions. Would you like to respond? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Layla's nodding her head. Yeah. Um, I think especially uh, in the UK, the House of Lords, uh, while it is unelected, it, um, the, House of, <laughs> the House of Lords reforms have reduced the number of hereditary peers and the House of Lords uh, doesn't have any power over budgets. Uh, the Salisbury Convention prevents this. Uh, furthermore, uh, this allowed it to act um, in an unbiased way, uh, because it has it has no one to appease other than the morals that these people are supposed to hold. Interesting. So two two sides of the argument there. Very interesting. Um, so I've got a couple more questions. Um, what job opportunities can we see in the future when doing A level politics? Um, well, I can use my example. I did A level politics back in the day, um, back in the mid nineties. Um, and um, I then, um, when I left, I did politics at university, um, and then I became a journalist for a couple of years, um, and then um, I um, worked for the European Commission for a few years, uh, and then I was on my way to work one day, and I thought, hmm, I think I really want to be a teacher. So I've had three careers, and I'm, I'm hoping this is the last one, um, but uh, people who did politics with me at university, um, one went on to work for uh, uh, HSBC as an international manager, earning a six-figure salary. Uh, one went to work uh, in a, uh, for WPP, one of the world's biggest um, advertising companies. Um, so you can go in lots of different directions. Um, my advice to you would be to pick the subjects that you are excited about. Um, unless you want to be a doctor, and then I think you know there's certain kind of subjects you do have to do. For most careers, you don't have to do a specific subject at A-level, um, um, but definitely do look into that. But I would say, uh, if you follow your heart, the results will follow too. Uh, so that would be my advice. And I've got one, two more questions, okay. Um, so do you think the US election exposed or encouraged people to acknowledge the failing attributes of our democratic system. I'm going to take this one because US politics is, is, my, is my passion. Um, the, US, the US political system is broken and it has been for uh, many years. Um, and it's, it's amazing that sort of the flaws haven't been exposed more before now. Um, if we look at the Electoral College, uh, it's a system that can allow the loser of the popular vote to become the president. And, and that's happened uh, twice um, in the 21st century. Um, and um, the trouble is, 
is that we all hold our noses up when something goes wrong in America, as if to sort of hold up what we do as, as something that is, is so, so much better. And OK, we have a secret ballot. And OK, our results tend to be trusted. We tend not to have politicians saying, you know, I won by a lot when you clearly lost by a lot. But we still have an electoral system that um, means that people go into the election booth and vote tactically, not necessarily for the party they like and want to vote for, but because they vote on the basis of the party they want to keep out. And I'm not sure that really makes any of us feel very good. So uh, my view would be is, though, is that those in glass houses shouldn't throw uh, stones. Um, on to the uh, next one. Do you believe there is a necessity for a monarchy in this day and age, especially in regards to the government and parliament? Um, well, I hope so, because I like The Crown. I think it's a great TV series and I want to see series five and six. Um, but um, do we have any views on the monarchy? Um, so Nayan wishing to go in to serve in Her Majesty's forces. Uh, do you have a view on that? Uh, yes, I will actually have to cross the aisle um, and, and support our opponents. Um, I, I, I would regard, uh, in, in the context of the United Kingdom, the monarchy is less of a an actual law-making institution, more of a, I suppose you could actually say, as, as Nick mentioned, the crown, more of a cultural one. So it's, it's almost as if um, you could describe it as a, as, a, as a peculiarity of the United Kingdom, something that we can all sort of get behind. Um, they don't, the, the actual crown, um, the royal family themselves don't, actually have any practical power generally speaking they tend to be more ceremonial um, again they have strong links to the armed forces i think they're more of um i think it, it's something of national character for our country and makes it different for everyone else anyone want to come back on that emily um so i once attended this lecture and it was the topic was like should we get rid of the royal family and i was like i, I don't like the royal family i think it's ridiculous that taxpayers money go towards like they're buying them Range Rovers, sending their kids to private schools. When like people are queuing up at food banks, I think it's ridiculous. I think we should get rid of them. But um, the lecture hall that I went to, like it was mainly college students, people voted to keep it. I think people see it as more of a cultural thing. And I think it worked out that it was only 50 pence per taxpayer that actually like per year that contributed towards it. So people see it as a small cost for entertainment, but I, the, the in principle, I completely disagree with them. Okay, so two different views um, uh, there. And if you uh, join the politics course, uh, you're going to hear a lot of contrasting views. And as you've seen here, um, the students respect each other, they're friends. Um, and so uh, that's what we kind of really, um, we, we really do um, foster and promote at the college, respectful language, respect for other people's views. Um, and then I think we all end up uh, much the richer for it. Um, I think we have to uh, end it there. I hope you have enjoyed um, this lecture, this debate, uh, this event as much as we have. Um, we've really enjoyed putting it on for you. And we hope to see uh, your lovely faces in person um, as soon as possible. So uh, we hope you stay safe and um, uh, enjoy uh, the Christmas period and we'll see you um, next year. Take care. Bye-bye.